Right. Thank you for joining uh, News Decoder at its first webinar of the 2019-2020 school year. My name is Nelson Graves, and I'm speaking to you today from actually Southern California, La Jolla, California. I'm the guest uh, of La Jolla Country Day School, which is one of the schools in News Decoder's network. Thank you very much for, for hosting us today, guys. Uh, our, our, uh, our session today is focusing on the Guantanamo Bay uh, detention camp. Um, I'm not going to say much by way of introduction because I want to turn it over to uh, the students here and to our, our guests on camera. Um, two lessons that I'm drawing from this already. One is this student driven. That's very consistent with News Decoder's um, um, uh, premise, which is that uh, young people deserve to be listened to. And also that we want to hear some contrasting viewpoints. I think this issue, among many others, is one where it's important to actually understand uh, several points. If you, if you want to resolve what you might consider to be a problem. With that, uh, I'll introduce the people on camera. Uh, as I said, I'm in La Jolla. These are students in Dan Norland's uh, history class. Uh, Dan is right here. Uh, and uh, let's have a hand for the students here. Thank you. And we have um, Alakdar Boumedian uh, in southern France. Um, Alakdar, you want to raise former detainee and will be speaking through an interpreter, uh, Manal Mufajed, who is in uh, Beirut, actually, very late in the evening there. Thank you for joining us, Manal. Uh, and we also have Kate Norland, who is Dan's sister, who is also in Beirut, uh, who has worked on this issue and who will also be helping elucidate some of the issues. So with that, I'm going to turn over. The session will go for one hour. Um, we want to hear from um, uh, Alakdar, uh, certainly at the, at the outset, and we want to take questions, as many questions as possible, certainly from the students here behind me, but also from anyone uh, who is participating from afar remotely. And uh, to ask a question, you can use either the chat function at the bottom of your screen or the Q&A, and I'll be monitoring that on the computer next to me. So with that, um, unless there's anything uh, else to do at this point, let's turn it over to uh, Juliet and, and Pip, who will be our main moderators here at school, actually, I didn't introduce them. This is uh, Juliet Welk and Pip Lewis, who are students in the class who have taken the trouble to uh, play, take the lead in the questioning uh, before we turn it over to uh, a broader group of students and uh, and uh, other participants. So, thanks very much. Over to you guys. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Juliet Welk, um, and I'm a senior here at La Jolla Country Day School uh, in San Diego, California. I'm Pip Lewis. I'm also in 12th grade at Country Day. And together, we'll be moderating today's panel discussion on national security, human rights, and the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. Um, and before we introduce our panelists, we'd like to provide a little brief background on the issue. Since 1903, the United States has maintained a naval base at Guantanamo Bay on the south southeastern tip of Cuba. Shortly after the attacks on September 11, 2001, the US government has built, built a military prison at Guantanamo to house the suspected terrorists. At its peak, almost 800 men were held there. Many have since been released, but 40 remain awaiting trial that may never take place. Guantanamo's supporters argue that it plays a vital role in the war on terror. They say that it would be too dangerous to release the detainees or to imprison them within the United States. They also claim that the interrogations that take place in Guantanamo, which are often described as enhanced interrogation, but some see that as a euphemism for torture, uh, yielded vital, vital information that helped prevent future terrorist attacks. Uh, Guantanamo's critics, however, argue that more humane interrogation techniques would have been more effective, and some experienced interrogators agree. Um, critics also point out that detaining people in Guantanamo is extremely costly at the moment. It's approximately $13 million per year for each of the men detained there. Uh, finally, critics claim that the treatment of Guantanamo detainees violates the Geneva Conventions, the American Constitution, and the fundamental principles of human rights. So today we have the opportunity to speak with a man who spent seven years in Guantanamo before winning a Supreme Court case and ultimately his freedom. Alakdar Boumedian has been a free man since 2009 when a judge ruled that there was no evidence to support the government's claim that he was a member of Al-Qaeda. Mr. Bignadian is joining us from the outskirts of Nice, France, where he lives with his wife and children. Our other two panelists, Kathleen Lewis and Daniel Norland, as if the women's women get in writing a book that is a deal. 
This was joined between Beirut, Lebanon, Russia, and Israel with the International Refugee Assistance Project as we move these field threats and assist us closely with refugees who are fielding fleeing violence and seeking resettlement. This now is in San Diego, California, where they happen to be taking on a government class. Before being a teacher, Ms. Nolan worked at, at the law firm that helped Mr. Boumediene win his freedom. So our first question is for Mr. Boumediene. Would you please tell us a little bit about your life in 2001 before you were detained and then what happened? Can you hear us? Um. Yes, Juliet, I hear you. I'm just uh, translating the question over WhatsApp. Okay, uh, could you, okay. we want to hear the translation too. So feel free to translate uh, verbally. Okay, I will. Alakhtar Safa, I'll talk to you about the air. Mumtaz, Zayed. So, you want to know how you were living in your life before the arrival? أول شيء أشكركم على الاستضافة قبل الاعتقال كنت أعمل تحب أتكلم قليل قليل وأوقف ولا منال نعم نعم قليل قليل وتوقف جيد قبل الاعتقال في غوانتنامو كنت أعمل مع هيئة الهلال الأحمر شبيهة بالصليب الأحمر عندكم الصليب الأحمر وعندنا الهلال الأحمر كنت أعمل فيه كموظف إغاثي كما كانت لدي بنتين متزوج لي بنتين وكنت أعمل في قسم الأيتام ترجمي بعدين يا واسل Thank you so much for hosting me today Before the detention in Guantanamo Bay Prison I used to work for the Red Crescent. It's similar to Red Cross uh, in the US. I used to be a relief staff member and uh, I used to work mainly with uh, um, orphans. And I was married uh, with two daughters. كان عندي حوالي 1500 يتيم البنات وأولاد I was taking care of uh, 1500 orphan and these were the children uh, whose parents were killed during the war between Bosnia and Serbia and um, uh, the uh, institution I used to work for sponsored these kids. وفي تلك الفترة لم تكن لأي علاقة بأي جماعة سواء إسلامية أو إرهابية أو أي أي شيء كان كله شغل إغاثي يعني عمل إغاثي مئة بالمئة. وكنت كنت حتى أتعامل مع وزارة اللاجئين مباشرة يعني. At the time, I didn't have any connection with any Islamic terrorist group or any other group. My work was pure relief, and I used to deal directly with the Ministry of Refugees. تقريباً هذا هكذا كانت حياتي قبل ال قبل الاعتقال. This is a brief about my life before detention. Thank you. I think you had a question. Yeah. Um... Could you tell us a bit more about what the conditions were like in Guantanamo? Uh, the question is, how was the life in Guantanamo? The life of life? It was very difficult. I mean, even when I talk, I can't even say it. The conditions of life in Guantanamo were very difficult. There are no words to describe these conditions. It was surreal. I will mention a few things because I don't want to take much of your time. 
عندما اعتقلوني واخذوني الى غوانتنامو طبعا الاعتقال من البوسنه الى امريكا كان حوالي 48 ساعه العينان مغمضتان والاذنان حاجز حتى لا اسمع ولا ارى اي شيء لمده يومين When I was detained, first detained, uh, I was moved from Bosnia to the U.S. Uh, this trip lasted for 48 hours. I was blindfolded and they blocked my ear, so I don't hear or see anything for two days in a row. Uh, we've had a technical issue here. Um, Alakda, uh, maybe might be your end. Let me just check here. Yeah, he may have to reconnect. Um, uh, Alakda, I don't know if you can hear me, but you may have to reconnect your computer so we can, because at this point you're frozen. Uh, Nelson, I will let him know through WhatsApp. Thank you very much. Let's see if the students here at this point, while we're waiting for him to reconnect, um, any observations or um, questions that come to your mind that you didn't have before based on what you've heard so far, which is not perfect on, I realize, but maybe some of you have anything surprising here? Have you heard any, uh, any other detainees before? You never heard another I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right. We're back. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, when I said, when I saw my eyes, I found myself in a cage, like the كانت أفاعي بجنب الأقفاص يعني تمشي حتى كانت تدخل على بعض المساجين كان شيء لا يوصف يعني شيء لا يوصف يعني كانت بالنسبة لي صدمة أفتح عيني أجد نفسي في منطقة شبه صحراوية مثل الصحراء ما كنت أعرف أصلا أين أنا يعني And when I opened my eyes I found myself in a cage similar to an animal cage, and there were snakes around the cage. These snakes infiltrated to some uh, uh, cages where other inmates were detained. It was a shock for me. I opened my eyes and found myself in a, desertic area, a, a desert area. I didn't know where I was. يعني كان ظروف قاسية جدا يعني. The conditions were very harsh. أتذكر حتى يعني مدة أسبوع أو عشرة أيام لم نستحم وبعد العشرة أيام هذه يعني كانوا يخرجوننا أمام يعني كل كل سجين يخرجوه أمام كل المساجين عريان يعني كما خلق يعني. They didn't let us shower for one week or ten days. And after the 10 days passed, they took every inmate out in front of everybody and made us uh, undress. ناهيك عن يوم أخذوني إلى غوانتنامو كانت الكلبشات هذه في يدي كانت مضغوطة كثير عندما وصلت هناك فعملت لي يعني مثل الجروح وممكن بعد شهر حتى عالجوني يعني. And when I arrived to Guantanamo, uh, my hands were cuffed and the cuffs were very, uh, were pressing very hardly on my hands. And I started having wounds everywhere. Uh, they, uh, they gave me treatment only after one month. You can still see the scars on my hands. This is a general uh, idea about what I experienced in prison. Thank you. And um, why do you think it's important for America to go to 
لقد لماذا تظن أنه من المهم على الأمريكيين أن يسمعوا هذه القصة؟ لأن كثير من الأمريكيين للأسف الشديد لا يعرفون أن توجد معتقلات في الأردن توجد معتقلات في مصر توجد معتقلات في, في, في المغرب في كثير من الدول حتى في آسيا آه هذه المعتقلات يعني أمريكية تدار بأموال أمريكية والأموال هذه من يدفعها الشعب هي ضرائب الشعب ولكن تذهب لغير مكانها يعني يعني مثلا كيت او دانيال يدفع ضرائب ولكن هذه الضرائب تستخدم في في ادلاء الناس او في قتل الناس او في سجن الناس يعني او في اشياء خارجه عن القانون حتى القانون الدولي يعني ولكن بضرائب الشعب يعني باموال الشعب Because the American people do not realize that there are detention centers in Jordan, in Egypt, in Morocco, and in different places, even in Asia, that are run by America, and they are uh, funded by American uh, funds. And these funds come from the taxes that the people pay, but they do not use uh, the funds or the money in, in a good place. For example, Kate and Daniel would pay taxes and this money would go to humiliate people or to imprison them, to uh, implement on them practices that do not respect any law and not uh, uh, international law in particular. يعني الشعب الأمريكي عمل حروب حروب من أجل الحرية ومن حقوق الإنسان ولكن الحكومة تعمل هذه الأشياء ولكن بوجه ثاني يعني مخالف يعني the American administration waged wars uh, under the banner of uh, freedom and human rights, but actually there's another facet for these wars. فلهذا أريد أعرف الشعب الأمريكي أنه يوجد ظلم يعني يوجد ظلم الحكومة الأمريكية تظلم يعني ولكن تحاول أن تبحث عن مبررات اسم الإرهاب محاربة الإرهاب وأنا دليل يعني جابوني من بيتي من عملي ثم بعد سبع سنوات ونصف يقولوا لي أنت بريء هذا يعني مغاير مخالف يعني. The American government uh, always uh, uh, carries out uh, unjust uh, uh, practices, but then they find justifications and they always claim that they are doing all of this to fight against terrorism. I am the biggest proof that their practices are not correct. They uh, arrested me at my house, and after seven years and a half, they let me out, saying that I was innocent. Jayit. Thank you. Another question, please. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bonita, in reading your book, I was struck by the degree to which you uh, are going towards America and Americans. عندما قرأ قرأت الطالبة القصة فجأها جدا كم كنت متسامحا مع الشعب الأمريكي هل يمكنك أن تخبرها أكثر عن سبب هذا التسامح الدافع وراء هذا التسامح أنا متسامح مع أي شخص ليس فقط الأمريكي يعني في الأخير أنا إنسان ومن طبع الإنسان التسامح وهكذا تربيت منذ صغاري التسامح يعني لماذا أحقد على أمريكي لم يعمل لي شيء يعني الحقد لا يولد إلا الكراهية والكراهية في الآخر أظنها لا تستحق أن تكون بين, ال... بين الإنسانية uh, Forgiveness is in my nature I am forgiving with everyone not only Americans I believe that as human beings we have to be merciful uh, towards each other this is how I was raised since I was small. I believe that grudges only give birth to hatred, and hatred should not be among us. الشيء الثاني أنا مسلم ومعنى الإسلام السلام ليس مثل ما تصوره بعض القنوات التلفزيونية حتى تثير المشاكل ويمثلون دائما الإسلام هو الإرهاب. الإسلام شيء يعني هو دين دين عظيم دين سلام 
ليس له علاقه بالارهاب لانه الارهابي ليس شرط يكون مسلم، الارهابي قد يكون امريكي متطرف، قد يكون فرنسي متطرف، قد يكون يهودي متطرف، لا علاقه للارهاب باي دين، اي دين كان سواء الاسلام او المسيحيه او او اليهودي. انا تربيت من منذ صغاري انه ديني هو دين السلام فقط. And the second reason is that I'm a Muslim and Islam is equivalent to peace. Um, it's not like uh, some television channels show uh, to the public uh, just to create problems. Islam is not equal to terrorism. Islam is a great religion. It's a religion of peace. Terrorists can be anything, can be Muslim, can be, uh, can be an American, an, an American a, a French or a Jewish person. These are extremists and they don't know any religion. Since I was born, I was, I was uh, uh, taught uh, to respect rel my religion and I was taught to treat everyone with peace. Thank you. Um, now, in a moment, we'll open up the uh, floor for questions from the audience and from the others who are listening in. Um, but first, we wanted to hear from uh, other panelists. Ms. Bliss, could you please talk about your experience meeting Mr. Boumediene for the first time and, and hearing his story? هل أختر بعض لحظات سوف نفتح المجال لأسئلة أخرى من الحضور الذين يتابعون معنا هذا الحوار لكن جيد. سنسمع من كيت حول تجربة تجربتها معك So I, I went to France uh, with Daniel in, in July of, of 2011 and we conducted interviews with Lakhtar for about seven days. Um, and they were, they were long days of, uh, of just he and I talking first about his life before Guantanamo and then about his experiences there and about what his life was like afterwards. Um, and we recorded these conversations and um, I'm sure, I'm sure Lakhtar remembers this too, that they were very long days and it, I think it was, it was yes. hard for both of us. Um, for me, I think the main impression that, that stayed with me is the difference between knowing about something from objective facts from outside and then knowing about something from a person who's there in front of you. I think I came into the interviews having read a lot about Guantanamo, trying to prepare myself and to know the background so that I wouldn't ask stupid or unnecessary questions. And I felt that I had a very good general understanding of, of what people had been through at Guantanamo. And the difference when speaking with Lakhtar was that I saw the consequences of what had happened. I knew before that it had been a crime, that what the U.S. had done at Guantanamo had been objectively wrong. And that you don't have to meet with someone in person to know that. And it would have been wrong no matter who had been sitting in front of me in those interviews. But what was different about speaking to a person who had been through it was that you see, you see that the harm was done to an individual who has infinite worth that's the thing about human persons. That's why we talk about human rights, because human dignity is, is infinite. And that means that when it's violated and when, when harm is done to a person, that harm is infinite and it has infinite repercussions until, until it's righted. Um, so that was, what, that was what stuck with me, that I, I was overwhelmed with the, the personal detail of what he'd been through and, and the fact that, that this harm... Uh, until we make it right, it, it just goes on forever. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'll face the microphone. Um, can you please tell us a bit more about the significance uh, of Mr. Boumediene's Supreme Court case? Yeah, absolutely. So, Boumediene v. Bush, a Supreme Court case that I think students in constitutional law classes read today, uh, is, is an extremely important case. I remember during listening to the oral argument in the Supreme Court uh, and the, there was discussion about cases from the 1700s 
there was discussion about habeas corpus and lots of Latin terms. And it was a very sort of complex legal argument. But at the end of the day, the case stands for the proposition that if the United States government wants to lock somebody up, uh, at a certain point, that person has to have a meaningful opportunity to establish their innocence. And the Bush administration set up Guantanamo where it did in the way that it did in the hopes that it, it would create sort of a, a prison beyond the reach of the law. And when we did the Bush is when the Supreme Court said, no, the, the US Constitution applies here too. Um, and I think you know, what was so powerful to me about meeting Bakta uh, and hearing his story is you realize that these, these cases that have you know, fancy Latin words and arguments about case law from the 1700s really have a concrete meaningful impact on actual people's lives. Uh, and you know, I think about it. If, if William B. Bush came before the Supreme Court today, um, I wonder if the result would be the same. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. And that you sort of see if, if you walk up just how fundamentally important these decisions are. But as Kate said, they can lead to infinite harm or potentially attempts to, to write that. Yeah, could I just follow up with a question of you on this? So <clears throat> what was the breakdown in the uh, among the justices in, in the vote? Uh, and why did the vote not have broader consequences with respect to the continuation of Guantanamo? So it was a 5-4 decision, Justice Kennedy was decision, to bring justice as he often was. Uh, and in terms of the lasting consequences, I mean, initially after the decision, what it meant was that every single Guantanamo detainee could file a petition to argue their innocence, and many did. Uh, some of them argued successfully, some argued unsuccessfully. Uh, uh, many, many people were released from Guantanamo during that time period. But it's it was, down from how many uh, total to how many now? At its peak, it was close to 800. Right. Uh, when George W. Bush left office, it was uh, around 250. Right. Uh, when Barack Obama left office, it was 41, and now the number is 40. 40. Okay. Right. Do we have to thank you? Uh, I think that's just uh, a follow up question. But, um, why do you think it's so important for young people to hear Mr. Dean Gang's story? Well, I think, honestly, I think Kate and Lockhart will both answer that question more eloquently than I can. But I just think it's a powerful example of what a person can overcome. And, and just how important it is that we pay attention. Thank you. And with that, um, we're going to open up uh, the, the floor to sure. the audience. So, would anyone here at Country Day like to ask a question? Yeah, let's go for it, guys. Who's, who's got some guts here? You both <laughs> submitted questions, so you've got questions, I know. Yeah, please. And please speak up because you're in the back of the room. Uh, I was just wondering what the transition was like coming out from uh, Guantanamo. So the transition uh, from Guantanamo to um, freedom. الأكثر الآن تتلقى الأسئلة من الطلاب الجالسين في الخلف. يقولون كيف كان الانتقال من تجربة السجن في Guantanamo إلى الحرية. في البداية صراحة كانت صعب عندما كان بوش يهدد وكذا ظننت نفسي أني أبقى إلى آخر أيامي في, في السجن ترجمي بعدنا كرواصل At the beginning it was difficult to make the transition 
Bush was threatening me. I thought I would stay in prison for the rest of my life. لكن بعد مقا 2004 بعد مقابلة المحامين المحامين أعطوني أمل فصرت أتخيل يعني عندما أخرج ماذا أفعل وكذا يعني فقط مثل الأحلام وعندما أخر تفضل تفضل But in 2004 after I met with the lawyers uh, I was fueled with hope uh, I started imagining what I would do when I go out. I was like daydreaming. وعندما خرجت وجدت وجدت نفسي متأخر جدا يعني بقرون يعني هي كلها سبع سنوات ونصف لكن وجدت اختلاف كثير من حيث أشياء لم أراها من في السجن هواتف نقالة أو حتى في البداية كنت لا أعرف أمشي لأن كنت في السجن ما عرفيان يا إما بهذا الشبشب لكن عندما خرجت بحذاء كنت لا أعرف أمشي مثل الناس يعني كنت أستغرب كم مثل الطفل الذي يتعلم المشي When I went out of prison I found myself behind as if ages have passed although it was only seven years and a half but I saw things that I've never seen before like mobile phones, and imagine I couldn't walk because I was always wearing slippers in prison. When I went out and put on real shoes, I couldn't walk. I was like a child who had to learn how to walk again. It was difficult at the beginning. I faced many difficulties, but then I adapted. Shukran. Thank you. When you came out, like in a normal release from prison, it's like tough to get a job and like to fully come back. And I was wondering how uh, coming back from Guantanamo, how you not only just came back to regular life, but like into the business world and else related. So transition, transition back into uh, a professional uh, life. How was that? Al Akhtar, يسألونك عن حياتك المهنية. كيف كان الانتقال من السجن إلى الحياة المهنية من جديد إلى العمل؟ في البداية يعني كنت تقريبا يأس يعني. لأني أنا عندي دبلوم في في مهنة معينة ثم عندما أتيت هنا تقريبا خمس سنوات بدون عمل لأنه عندما أذهب وأطلب عمل يسألوك على ماضيك يعني عندما يجدون سبع سنوات فارغة ما تستطيع تقول أنا كنت في غوانتانامو لأن غوانتانامو بالنسبة لجميع الناس في العالم يعني شيء مخيف ف لا استطيع اوصف لك كم كنت كم كنت اتعذب يوميا يعني عندما اتذكر لان الحكومه الامريكيه هل تسببت لهذا الشيء يعني نعم تفضلي تفضلي من at the beginning i felt i was in despair i have a diploma in a certain profession but after I was re released from prison, I couldn't find any job for around five years. Uh, every time I went to apply for a job, they asked me, where was I uh, in these missing seven years? I couldn't say that I was in Guantanamo because Guantanamo is equivalent to uh, horrible experiences. I don't have the words, to, the words uh, to describe how much I suffered on a daily basis. And I feel sad because the American government caused all of that to me. ولأنه عندي أولاد يجب أن أجد عمل مؤخر يعني الآن عندي تقريبا سنة ونصف أشتغل في في مصنع وقبل الشهر ونصف تقريبا عملت حادث يعني رفعت شيء ثقيل فتكسر ظهر الآن أنا عاطل أنجل سيلفيت. سلامتك.
and I have children, I have to provide for them. I've been working for the last two years and a half in a factory, but unfortunately, one month and a half ago, I had an accident and I, br I broke my back. So now I'm unemployed again and I'm staying at home. Thank you. There was a question. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, after having the mindset in Guantanamo that you might be there for life, do you ever have any thoughts about escaping? Did you hear the question, Mana? No, Nelson, I'm so sorry. Uh, did, did he ever have any thoughts about escaping, uh, given that he at one point thought he might be there for the rest of his life? Al Akhtar, Alman Anaka Fakert Lilahta. أنك سوف تمضي طيلة حياتك في السجن. هل فكرت يوما في الهرب من السجن في إيجاد مخرج؟ هناك في غوانتانامو حتى إذا فتحوا الأبواب ويقول لك تستطيع تذهب لا تستطيع لأن الجزيرة كلها محيط هي في المحيط وكل البحر المحيط بها يعني كلها سماك القرش أين تذهب يعني؟ لا تستطيع تخرج يعني. I didn't uh, even dare thinking about it because Guantanamo <coughs> is located on an island in the middle of the ocean. And even if they opened the doors of the prison and told us to leave, we wouldn't leave because we're surrounded by sharks. Where would I go? <laughs> so, thank you. Someone had a question about the day-to-day -day, uh, life in at Guantanamo. Who asked that? Yeah. Uh, what was it, an average day in Guantanamo? And you, there was a couple other questions. Uh, what did they feed you? Yeah. It's the first, sorry, second question on this. I have a question over for student. I can? Ah. Yes, absolutely. Please go. I like that. Go, please. Manal, قولي لهم معظمكم قرأتم الكتاب يعني. هل تعرفون قصة لماذا سميت القضية ببومدين ذي الدبوش؟ يعني لماذا هذه الاسمين يعني؟ من يعرف؟ وقولي لدانيال لا يقول لهم اوكي سو دانيال بليز دو نوت ريفيل ذا انسر ذا كويشن از ادريس تو ذا ستودنتس سو موست اوف يو ريد ذا بوك do, do you have any idea why the case was called Bumidian versus Bush? Why these two names were selected for this case? Okay, who can answer that question? Go ahead, Dave, you have to speak up, maybe. Uh, your name is Bumidian, so it's your case versus Bush, which was the president at the time because his administration set up the town of and what was the basis for uh, al uh, case? It was, a, it was a stupid case. He was suing. And why was he suing? On what grounds was he suing the U.S. government? It was... Yeah. Right. And what is the writ of habeas corpus? Uh, it's the ability to present basically, it's fine. Speak up. Um, he was looking for a writ of habeas corpus, meaning um, to, to present a body of evidence, like, literally, um, meaning you, you wanted to be able to argue your case in court, um, and you were suing for the ability to be able to argue your case. And to be represented, I think. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, Nelson, the, the voices were very faint. I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear anything. Can you give me a general idea? I'm so okay. sorry. That's okay. No worries, no worries. 
Um, I'll repeat, I, I said that, well, Gus mentioned that um, it was for Mignon's blush because uh, you were the plaintiff and uh, therefore uh, it was your last name. And versus Bush, who uh, you were suing his administration, he was the president at the time. Um, and so that's where Boumediene v. Bush is. And then you had a follow-up question asking uh, what, what was the case about, what were you arguing? Um, and to that, I answered that you were suing for writ of habeas corpus, uh, which means kind of to be able to argue your innocence in court. Al Akhtar, Al Ijaba. أنت كنت مقدم الدعوة لذا كانت الدعوة باسمك وكنت ترفع الدعوة ضد الرئيس الإدارة التي حكمت في عهدك عندما كنت في السجن وهو بوش لذلك سميت القضية باسمك باسمكما وقد سئل سؤال متابعة عما كانت تتمحور القضية وكانت الإجابة أنك كنت تريد إثبات براءتك هل الإجابة صحيحة؟ Half of your answer is correct. Ah, what's the other half? So, what is the 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 half? So, what is فقال لي نعمل القضية باسمك فقلت لا أنا لا أنا كنت خائف يعني هو يقول لي بومدين ضد بوش قلت أنا لا رفضت أنا كنت خائف هو قال لي تمثل كل المعتقلين في قوانتنام قلت لا أنا لا رفضت في البداية فقال لي أقول لك شيء بومدين هو رئيس جزائري شيوعي وبوش رئيس أمريكي لكن رأس مالي قال نترك رئيس مع رئيس وفي الأخير سنرى من يفوز الرأس مالي أم الشيوعي ولكن أظن الشيوعي سيفوز على الرئيس نعم so actually for your information uh, my name my first name is Boumediene and it's similar to the name of an Algerian president former president when I met with my lawyers and uh, um, at the top of the list was Thief. They suggested that I was file a case uh, carrying my name and Bush's name. I refused at the beginning because I was scared. They said to me, you will be representing all the inmates, all the detainees. And then I said, no, I'm scared. Maybe I'd rather not do that. But then they convinced me by saying that Boumediene, the president of Algeria was a communist while Bush is the president of the U.S. and he's a capitalist. So we will uh, uh, put the two presidents in the face of each other and let's see who will win. But I believe deep, I believe deep down that the communist president would win. <laughs> you weren't expecting that to answer that question. Along those lines, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the t-shirt you made? T-shirt? Yeah, the the Bush T-shirt. Okay. <laughs> the T-shirt T-shirt Bush Zero. في الحكم النهائي للسبريم كورت يعني في 22 نوفمبر 2008 وقبلها في 2006 كذلك فزت عليه فلهذا قبل ما أخرج سرقت قلم من عند المساجين المسموح لهم أنا كان غير مسموح لي وكتبت في تيشيرت وأخرجت معي التيشيرت هذا إلى إلى الخارج أه Daniel, I still keep this T-shirt. Actually, it was a T-shirt where I wrote Boumediene 2 and Bush 0. It was a scoring system that I made on my T-shirt. Because uh, as far as I remember, I have won twice against Bush. Once in the 22nd of November in 2008, and before that in 2006 uh, in a Supreme uh, Court. Um, and 
I have stolen a pen from the inmates who were, were entitled to keep pens because I was not entitled. And I wrote these words down on my T-shirt and I took it out when I uh, le left prison. And I still keep it until now. ممكن دانيال يصحح لاني لا اذكر 2006 2008 او او تاريخ اخر يعني. دانيال كان كوريكت مي اف اي مستيكن ريجاردينغ ديتس 2006 2008 اي دونت ريمبر فيري ويل. مضبوطين التواريخ الاخضر. جيد شكرا. ثانك يو. What was an average day like in Guantanamo? Like, what did they do? What was the average day uh, in the detention camp life? What, what was he fed? What, what activities did they have? Alakhtar, how did you feel on a daily basis in the Guantanamo? What was the work that you did and what were the activities that you did on a daily basis? هناك شيء روتيني يعني يعني يختلف من من معسكر الى معسكر طبعا انا كانوا يسموني يعني بالراس القاسي استبرمان كانوا يقولوا لي دائما انت راسك يعني قاسي يعني صلب فكانوا دائما يكثرون علي العقوبات اما اليوم كان روتيني جدا يعني صباح فطور معظم الفطور يكون بيض او حليب الغداء على حسب فاصوليا سوداء مثل الزفت هذا يعني لا تستطيع اصلا تشم رائحتها العشاء لا اذكر صراحه وخلال سبع سنوات ونصف انا اصلا السنتين ونصف الاخيره لم اتذوق طعم يعني كنت اطعم الانف بالانبوب يعني اجباري يعني بالنسبة للخروج للشاور يعني يخرجوك عشر دقائق هذه في البداية أنا أتكلم عن البداية السجن يعني عشر دقائق وإذا تتكلم مع واحد حتى ولو تقول السلام عليكم أو أو جود مورنينج أو جود أفترنون يدخلوك كأنك يعني ارتكب مخالفة ويحرمونك من المشي يعني من التشميس يعني حتى يعني لا ترى الشمس أصلا يعني في الظل دائما يعني تقريبا هذا Now, um, there were ro different routines in the different uh, camps, but I used to be called the stubborn man because I was really stubborn. I had a s solid personality. Um, I was punished uh, often. And um, when it comes to breakfast, we used to wake up every morning and have breakfast. Usually it's eggs and uh, milk. Uh, for lunch, we would have uh, black beans, but they were like black tar that you would put on the roads. It was really not tasty at all, and it smelled very bad. I couldn't smell it. I don't remember anything uh, about uh, uh, dinner. Uh, but uh, please note that uh, I am talking about the beginning of my experience because in the two last years, I didn't have any food. I was on a hunger strike. Uh, they used to feed me. Uh, uh, they used to feed me uh, through my nose, um, through a tube uh, inserted in my nose, and it was mandatory. I didn't uh, choose it. Um, regarding shower, they would uh, take us out um, and uh, let us shower for ten minutes. But if we ever met each other and greeted each other, like saying good morning or uh, good evening, they would beat us as if uh, we broke the law. And the punishment would be depriving us from walking under the sun. عندما أقول كلمة صبرمن ليس معناتها أن كنت إنسان سيء بالعكس أنا في السنة الأولى كنت متعاون جدا يعني حكيت حياتي منذ ولدت إلى يوم الاعتقال وحتى بعد الاعتقال تكلمت يعني كل ما كنت أعمل و. كيف كانت حياتي أقربائي عائلة يعني تكلمت كل شيء بعد سنة شفتهم ليسوا جديين في الأمر عرفت أنهم فقط يريدوا احتجازي بدون أي تهمة فلهذا وقفت أتكلم معهم لهذا سموني ستابانمان يعني هو المحقق الذي سماني ليس أنا اللي سميت نفسي يعني 
when I say stubborn, I don't mean I was bad. Actually, I was very cooperative at the beginning. I told them my life story from when I was born until I was detained. I shared with them all the stories about my life, my relatives, my family. Even after I went out of deten detention, I kept on sharing my story. But uh, after spending one year in prison, I found, found out that they were not serious and they uh, only wanted to keep me in prison without uh, any uh, trial or without any real accusation. Uh, it was the interrogator who gave me this, me this uh, description, stubborn man. Uh, I didn't give it to myself. Wow. Thank you. We had a question actually from um, a student at uh, Gymnasio Los Calvos in Bogota, Colombia. Um, and it relates to food. Um, and you've pretty much already answered that question, uh, Alakdar. It didn't sound like the food was very, very tasty um, or even adequate, shall we say. Um, but I had a follow up on that. You mentioned your, your hunger strike, um, which relates to food. Um, what was the goal of your hunger strike? And do you think it was successful? Did you achieve that goal? الآن الأخضر وردنا سؤال من طلاب في كولومبيا يقولون إنك كنت مضربا عن الطعام لفترة سنتين وكان سؤالهم يتمحور حول الطعام الذي تناولته في السجن لكنك أجبت عن هذا السؤال متابعة على هذا السؤال هم يسألون ما كان الهدف من هذا الإضراب عن الطعام وهل حققت الهدف الذي تبتغيه بالنسبة لإضراب الطعام أنا تكلمت معهم وقلت لهم أنا الإضراب الطعام هذا لأنهم كانوا يصرون على أني أني أوقف الإضراب قلت لهم أنا أكل الطعام وأعمل الرياضة ما عندي مشكلة لكن فقط إجابة واحدة لماذا أنا هنا في غوانتانامو لم أجد سؤال لمدة سبع سنوات ونصف طبعا الخمس سنوات الأولى هذيك كنت دائما معه مشاكل وكذا لماذا أنا؟ دائما السؤال لماذا أنا موجود هنا ولم أجد جواب مقنع يعني فلهذا اتخذت قرار أني أعمل الإضراب لا أعرف لكن كان قرار سريع وبالعكس في الأول أنا كنت ضد الناس الذين يضربون عن الطعام وكنت أقول لهم لا تؤذوا أنفسكم ولا تهلكوا أنفسكم و و و و ولكن في الأخير اضطريت أنا أعمل مثل الذين عملوا الإضراب نعم The reason behind the hunger strike was that I spoke uh, to the prison officials many times and um, they didn't listen to me. I used to ask them regularly, why am I here? I spent five years and a half in prison and I never knew why I was in prison and nobody ever gave me an answer. When I went on a hunger strike, they insisted that I stop it and then that I eat food. I, say I, will only, I said I will only eat food and exercise uh, when uh, you give me an answer, why am I here? My decision was fast, and um, at the beginning, I was against people who went on hunger strike. I advised them not to hurt themselves uh, by depriving them of themselves from food. Uh, but then I found myself compelled to do the same like uh, the others did. ومتابعة لنفس السؤال يعني أكيد الناس تتسأل كيف كنت تأكل الطعام الإضراب هذا في الأوقات العادية كانوا مرتين الصباح واحدة والمساء واحدة وهي علبة من الإنشور أظن بالإنجليزي اسمه الإنشور هي علبة مثل التي تباع في الصيدليات أما في رمضان لأنه سمحونا بالصيام في آخر السنة في البداية كان صعب في الأخير سمحونا بالصيام فكانوا يعطونا فقط واحدة الساعة عشرة بالليل يعني كانوا يعطوني علبة إنشور واحدة خلال 24 يوم 24 ساعة 24 ساعة نعم أعفوان أعفوان في ذلك الرجال أيضا يمكنك أن تسألون كيف يمكنني أن تفيدني وما يمكنني أن تفيدني وما يمكنني أن تفيدني وما يمكنني أن تفيدني في الأسبوع 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 once in the morning and once in the evening. 
they would give me this box of, I believe you call it uh, in the US, Inshur. And then during Ramadan time, uh, they, they allowed us finally to uh, fast. At the beginning, fasting was not allowed, was forbidden. But at the end of my detention, they allowed me to fast. So during Ramadan days, they gave me one box of Inshur uh, every day at 10 uh, p.m. at night. So in, in 24 hours. So this is all I ate in 24 hours. Shukran. Thank you. We've got five more minutes, and I thought I'd, I'd uh, try to shift just to the future a bit, um, if I might, and ask, uh, you want to ask a question about the future, what happens to Guantanamo and yeah. why, why it hasn't been closed down? Right. I mean, I think a, a good point to go from here, like you said, is looking to the future. Um, and kind of going forward, what do you think the U.S. policy should be uh, in terms of, of the detention center at Guantanamo Bay? So that's of, uh, of, of all the panelists, actually. I'd be interested in hearing from them. Now, the next question is to ask all of the participants, on the basis of what you said, what do you think about this topic now? How do you think about the United States and the United States and the United States and the United States and the United States? The answer is to open. ولكن عدم غلقه يوجد ناس يستفيدون من من سجن غوانتانامو لانهم هم يقولون نحن ندفع ما اعرف كم مليون دولار على الشخص الواحد مثل ما قرات في التقرير ولكن هذا غير صحيح يعني يوجد مسؤولين في الحكومه الامريكيه يعني يستفيدون من من بناء السجون خارج الولايات المتحده او ادارتها على سبيل المثال سجن غوانتانامو تعرفون من 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 يستفيد منه المسؤول الاول هو ديك تشيني هو الذي بناه وهو اي مؤسسه ديك تشيني هي التي بنت غوانتانامو وابو غاري في العراق يعني ناس مسؤولين في الحكومه يستفيدون منه لهذا لا يريدون اغلاقه I think the best solution would, would be to shut down, to close this prison. But I know that there are people benefiting from uh, keeping it open. I read in a report that uh, the administration pays $1 million for one inmate to, uh, to cover the expenses. No. Um, sorry, uh, I meant millions of dollars for each person to cover their expenses. This is what I read in a report. But I believe that there are officials, uh, high officials uh, in the government who benefit from uh, building these prisons outside the US. Do you know who is the uh, first one to benefit from Guantanamo Bay prison? It's Dick, Dick Cheney. And he's the one who built the prison, and he also built the prison in, uh, of Abu Ghraib in uh, Iraq. يعني هذه مؤسسات تابعة لديك تشيني التي بنت ال يعني شركته ب ب بالاختصار شركته يعني. Foundations uh, that are owned by Dick Cheney uh, were the ones who built uh, the prison. لأنه في الأصل أوباما عندما كان يعمل الحملة الانتخابية قال نغلق نغلق الجوانتانام ولكن ذهب أوباما ثمان سنوات وبعده ولم يغلق أوباما in his electoral campaign invited to close Guantanamo prison but he stayed in power for eight years and then someone else came into power and nothing changed الأختار هل هل ما تضيفه؟ جيد هل تريد أن تضيف شيئاً؟ لا 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 جيد انتهيت. No no we're good. Okay. So I guess the last question, and if I could just ask it, would be then, how do you explain that even when there was a president who for eight years had an official policy to close Guantanamo was unable to do so? And uh, if, if you did want to close it, what steps should one take? Uh, and I'd be interested in Kate and Dan's views on this as well. 
الأخطر السؤال ما تروح لك ولي دانيل ولي كيت دانيل شو داي أسك الأخطر أوكي فأترجم السؤال لك وهو مطروح على جميع المتحاولين السؤال هو كيف تفسر أن رئيسا أمضى في الحكم ثماني سنوات وكان عنده قرار رسمي وجدي بإغلاق السجن ولكنه لم يتمكن من ذلك وفي حال أردت أنت في في عالم افتراضي أن تغلق السجن ما هي الخطوات التي كنت لتتبعها؟ everything they could to thwart any efforts to close Guantanamo. But I think in some ways that's that's too easy of an answer. I think um, a more complete answer would be we, we did not anticipate that it wasn't this groundswell of, of people saying this is a stain on our moral legitimacy as a country. This is an enormous waste of money. Um, and, and this is a symbol that is being used as a recruitment tool by terrorists. And I think if enough people had said that loudly and clearly, uh, then I think it would have been a lot harder for the, the obstructionists in Congress and the Senate to succeed. Okay. Thank you. Kate, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree with, with what Daniel said. Um, and I also, I noticed a question in writing about, uh, about reparations. I, I think that if there were the kind of movement that Daniel's talking about to, to say this is, a, this is a crime that, that is being committed in our names, we, we as Americans, uh, that could lead to the closure of Guantanamo and, and then also to some kind of effort to, to make redress for the wrongs that, that were done. Um, through reparations, and that wouldn't be, you know, nearly enough. But it would be, uh, it would be something. It would be something concrete for the people whose lives have been materially harmed by Guantanamo, and it would be a, you know, a tremendously powerful uh, symbol and statement of repudiation. We had one last. Thank you, Kate. One last question from uh, from the floor, so to speak. Um, uh, what about your mental health? Al-Aqtar, what about your mental health? What kept you sane uh, in Guantanamo? Al-Aqtar, a question before the question of the question. How was your health in prison? In another way, what did you keep in your life during your experiences in prison? How did you keep in your life? أول شيء كنت أؤمن بشيء بحاجة اسمها القدر يعني القدر يعني لا أتحكم في القدر لا نعرف كلنا جميعا لا نعرف ماذا سيحدث غدا زلزال أم شم يعني لا نستطيع هذا قدر هذا أول شيء أؤمن به الشيء الثاني الذي كان يعني يحفزني لأنه رأيت ناس انتحروا وناس أصابهم الجنون فالشيء كذلك الذي كان يحفزني كثير كنت دائما أتذكر زوجتي وبناتي إذا أصير مجنون أو أموت يعني لازم أفكر فهذا كان يعطيني يعني حافز قوي جدا أني أبقى صامد يعني بالرغم من حالتي كانت سيئة وعندما كنت أعمل إضراب وزني نزل إلى 56 أو 55 كيلو يعني يعني كثير جدا يعني من 74 إلى 55 ولكن عندما تذكر زوجتي وبناتي لأن المحامين كانوا مرات يأتوني بالصور مرة يعطوها العسكر ومرة يأخذوها يعني إذا أرى صورة بنتي مرة في ست أشهر جيد أو سنة لكن كان حافز قوي جدا يعني شكرا uh, I am a person who believes in destiny nobody can control uh, their own destiny nobody knows what will happen to them tomorrow Maybe a theism will happen, maybe another a catastrophe. 
what motivated me, um, knowing that I've seen people in prison uh, committing suicide and other people going completely insane. But what kept me standing and motivated me was uh, my uh, wife and my daughters. I said to myself, I cannot go crazy and I cannot die. I have to be strong for them. Um, my uh, condition, my, my situation in prison was very bad, especially after the hunger strike. I lost uh, uh, weight. Uh, I used to weigh 74 and then I lost uh, weight and I reached 56 or 55 kilos at the end of the hunger strike. Um, the lawyers would bring me pictures from my family. Uh, sometimes the guards took this, these pictures away and I couldn't see them. But whenever they gave me a picture every six months or, or every one year, I felt that this uh, uh, brought uh, back uh, uh, soul to my body. Thank you. Well, with that, we're, we've actually gone past our time here. Um, uh, and we could, we could go on, but we'll, we'll have to cut it off there. Um, I say that if the, if the future of Guantanamo um, lies in our hands, uh, and the key is uh, understanding, as, uh, as Van said, then I guess we've done our part today. Um, and I wanted to thank, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, the Lea Day Day School and the students here for making this possible, for hosting it. I wanted to thank uh, Kate and Manal in uh, Beirut, and then above all, uh, Alaktar for your very powerful testimony um, today. Um, means a lot to us, thank you. And um, you're a born pedagogue, actually. Uh, I've learned a ter terrific amount. I'm sure others have as well. And just want to thank you and uh, say shukriya. Yeah, shukriya. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you.